Welcome back to Sidewalk Skyline Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Rogers. And one of the things in life that I probably don't do enough of is reminiscing and looking back at some of the previous seasons of my life and uh, just remembering some of the some of the really great things about the past. One of the really great things uh, that goes back in my past uh, 35 years was when I first met my guest on the podcast today, Paul Sherrill. Little did we know when we first met where our, our lives would lead us and where our lives would intersect. And uh, when I think about Paul and his work life from then until now, it really is a rabbit trail of God's unfolding grace. Uh, God has not wasted any time in Paul's life, even through the hard times. Uh, God has been at work to, uh, to form Christ in him and to prepare him for further works of service. We met back in Exeter, Ontario. Uh, I was a youth pastor in a church he was attending and he was working for Compassion Canada at that time, traveling with music artists and speakers all over North America. And following that, moved to Paris, Ontario, worked for a short time with Crossroads Communications. I left my ministry post in Exeter, moved to Windsor to plant New Song Church. Uh, but through those transitions in our lives, our friendship remained intact. And after some time, Paul and his family actually came and joined us in Windsor. Uh, at that time, uh, Paul had a strong leaning to establish missionary efforts in Bulgaria. He had been on some mission trips into Eastern Europe. And the hope was that uh, in moving to Windsor that New Song would uh, not only be a, a place uh, where he and his family lodged in our apartments, but also that uh, we would develop a home church uh, sending uh, capacity. Uh, but then Bulgaria began to fade and an urban vision really began to open up inside Paul, particularly for Windsor. And uh, Paul found work with St. Leonard's House, helping men from prison find housing in the community. Uh, then uh, through an association with another church, Antioch Christian Ministries, he established an urban church uh, slash mission called the Lazarus Commission. Uh, then uh, a season followed that of cl clinical pastoral education, leading to hospital chaplaincy in downtown Detroit for his training, and then hospitals in Windsor, and then a few years serving as chaplain at our hospice. So from hanging out with Christian rock bands, riding on the bus, to caring for people in great crisis. Paul's life has been filled with pastoral care. And uh, so welcome, Paul. Um, great to, to have this conversation with you. And just off the hop, let me say, you know, as I do reflect and think about those intersecting moments in our lives, uh, that you've been uh, such a strong influence in my life. Uh, you and I have had, at times had to have those hard conversations uh, because of something you were going through or something I was going through. And I always knew that I could, uh, I could trust your insight and, and trust you as a friend. So, so welcome, Paul. Great to have you on the podcast today. Good to be here. Yeah, and maybe the best play, place to start is to congratulate you on becoming a grandfather. So uh, tell us about that. How did that happen? Well, um, I didn't have much play in it. <laughs> I was just a grandpa on the side. Um, my son and daughter-in-law had two kids that, are, that I'm grandpa to, and uh, the boy has been with us for just over almost two years, and uh, the girl just joined us uh, last week. So, uh, and you know, Kind of romantically, her first name is actually named after one of the European cities that I really like, and that's Sofia. Sofia, Bulgaria, Bulgaria right. Yeah. 
that's not why he's called that, but it rings a bell with me when they came up with that name. Yeah. And uh, it's a very it's a very sweet name to me. Mm. So looking forward to see who she becomes. Mm. Um, in this podcast, uh, I interview people and talk about God at work in Canadian cities. And uh, so in the spirit of reminiscing, going back to our days in Exeter and our friendship with uh, Dwight Ozard. Mm -hmm. uh, Dwight was a uh, youth pastor at Metropolitan United Church, a large downtown uh, United Church in London, Ontario. And uh, they hired this uh, renegade Pentecostal pastor, Dwight Ozard, uh, to be their youth pastor. And uh, of course, our friendship, uh, the three of us, uh, we had opportunities to collaborate. Uh, we did a couple years of conferencing and called it Making the Music God Likes. And, uh, you know, what do you, uh, thinking back to those days, um, what do you remember about Dwight? What do you remember about us at that time with our vision for musicians and artists, uh, probably around 1990, 91? One of the things that holds kind of near and dear to me is he, he um, loved Olive Garden. <laughs> Olive Garden, yes. <laughs> and he liked the breadsticks at Olive Garden and pasta with jolly soup. And we ate our share of breadsticks. Yes, and, we did. And uh, he certainly did too. And we had a lot of good conversations. He was, he was kind of a loose wheel in some ways. He had good ideas, but uh, a lot of people in the church around didn't know quite how to deal with him mm -hmm. and that was part of the magic of him yeah he kind of he kind of liked pulling that little game off on people and would kind of stir people up and that was part of why i liked watching him because he would he would um get things going and uh seemed to always show up at the right time and um he was a question mark in some ways, and including his own death mm -hmm. was kind of a question mark because um, he wrote lots of little um, poems and lots of little little side, sidebar stories that kind of spoke of who he was, spoke of how faithful God was, but sometimes it would create these empty spaces that don't know really how to how to deal with them and yeah. I just want to look back at his stuff that he wrote and it it's kind of good it's kind of magical it's um, kind of off the top off the cuff kind of a guy and I think that's partly why he enjoyed the music stuff because he he seemed to really enjoy causing people to be a little bit upset mm -hmm. and that was some of how he ministered to people because he would, he would uh, get the Christian artists, preachers, whatnot, kind of worked up. Yeah. And that was a good thing. It was good for me. I, I think it was good for you. It was good for me, too. Uh, because, uh, growing, you know, I think with growing up in the church, um, at that time in the early 90s, uh, we, we needed a way to understand the church and we needed a way to understand uh, Jesus and and how does Jesus fit into the world around us mm -hmm. and uh, yeah a lot of a lot of great memories uh, with Dwight Dwight of course would go on to uh, Philadelphia where he uh, worked uh, in Tony Campolo's organization Evangelicals for Social Action and uh, was also, I forget, was he the editor or, uh, he was a lead anyways with Prism Magazine. And uh, anyways, um, in that realm of uh, American evangelicalism and uh, Dwight's foray into, into that, um, you also had an opportunity with Compassion to, to work with people like Tony Campolo. Mm -hmm. 
people uh, like uh, Bart Campolo, Brennan Manning, uh, and many others that I'm sure you could name endlessly. But uh, talk about some of those early days uh, of uh, being on a, on the road with compassion, and and how did um, uh, some of the voices that you were exposed to? Uh, how did that help in your spiritual formation? I know Brennan Manning was a huge influence, and and you shared him with me, and that in turn had a huge influence on me. Yeah, he he was a rock a boat guy for me. He really caused me to. You know, I was out with him one time in Estes Park, Colorado, and went to the little ice cream shop. Tony, or uh, those guys would always look for the ice cream. <laughs> Brendan loved ice cream. And he took me up to the ice cream, and he just all of a sudden said to me, right out, right out of the blue, do you know that God loves you? Mm-hmm. And he said, do you really know that he really loves you? Mm-hmm. And he kept on nailing on me on that. And uh, it was kind of frustrating, because I thought I was supposed to come up with some kind of trick answer for him, because I didn't quite understand what he was getting at, but he, he just, had this uh, this fierce look he could put in his eyes. Um, he had these gray eyes that um, would almost look cold when he would look at you. And if you're holding out on him, he'd cut through. And when he asked that, he then began to speak about how he knew that God loved him. And yeah. um, I don't think any Christian had really ever said that to me that way. Mm. It really was. Uh, disturbingly saying uh, hour at the restaurant there. And then he spoke at a conference a few days later and played on some of the same idea. And that really was shaving for what come out of the, in the end. Mm. But he he was not afraid to to um, poke a hole in your little secure spot. Yeah. Which I was not, not too happy with at first, but he really helped me. You know, when he uh, when he started to get sick, when he started to get his his stroke and unfold and his Alzheimer's, it was hard to reach into him um, because I never met him quite like that. Mm. And you had to kind of learn to hear him and learn to wait. Mm-hmm. And he he was very good at he was a master at at waiting, hmm. at letting himself get into the moment. Hmm. You know, he, he would sometimes speak about the, in ministry finding the sweet spot. And uh, everybody didn't know what he was talking about because nobody had ever quite described it that way. But it became evident that he, he knew there was this place where um, preachers had to wait on God, wait for him to talk, wait for him to lay out a plan. And get past their their little ways, and uh, that's very valuable stuff. It turned out it was really valuable in in uh, the work in hospice. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know how much he helped then, but he really did. You know, working at, at Compassion with the bands, did a lot of hospitality work, and that stuff of doing hospitality with with traveling musicians. Um, I've used that constantly in working in the hospice because you were always working with family the beggars, helping them to to um, make a way for themselves in their pain and their hurt. Yeah. And uh, it sometimes meant food, sometimes just meant being there, comforting. Yeah. Being silent and comforting. Yeah. Yeah. You you saw um, the lives of real people in the bus, not not what the lights and the Mm -hmm. sound system showed us on the other side Mm -hmm. in the audience. And uh, you were uh, really, then you were a pastor, you were a chaplain, weren't you? Yeah, didn't know I was, but but I was. uh, One one night in Port Huron, Michigan, at the downtown theater, I was there to see Bob Bennett, Mm-hmm. And uh, 
I was was really upset, having a hard time, and he was having some marital issues, mm -hmm. and I felt really at ease to to be his friend. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a really really a nice thing to be able to be, be somebody for somebody in that moment. Yeah, and, uh, I think I learned a lot of how to be uh, to do the hospitality part that I didn't know was so needed, yeah. both in the music industry and and in relationships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got a, I, I think a uh, a mighty fine education in pastoral care, right right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, you know, and get to be. People were working their stuff through and their songs. You know, some of them wrote great songs, but they could, couldn't get anything to work in their own life. Mm. They were just really messed up. And it was good to be able to be part of their life in those awkward moments, those great moments. Yeah. Yeah. Watch them grow, but get to be there myself. Yeah. You know, the. Uh, you know, the last few years have been have been amazing with uh, hospice and, and the hospital, helping people come to terms with feeling bent out of shape or lost mm. or not able, mm. not able to get their act together. You know, sometimes just sitting there with that, um, helping them open up their their bag of stuff yeah. and just cry. Yeah, you know. Cry out to God. Cry out to another person. Yeah. You know when uh, when our friend Dwight Ozard uh, got cancer, and and uh, I had you know some contact with him in his uh, uh, final final years from diagnosis till he passed. Uh, but I think back, uh, we were both in our our thirties. And um, you know, looking back, I I realize how inadequate I felt to be able to comfort our friend in his suffering, mm -hmm. and uh, and even today I still feel ill-equipped to always mourn with those who mourn. Um, let's go back to. Uh, your transition to hospital chaplaincy. How did how did that come about? And uh, you know, uh, how how? Yeah, I think was it through uh, John Stevenette? Yeah. Yeah, he was working briefly as a hospital chaplain. Yeah. And uh, was that your your door in? Yeah, he he was um, at um, that hospital. Mm -hmm. as a chapel, one of the chaplains there, and it was mostly why I took the training to become a chaplain. I was really quite quite disappointed, quite mad at him. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> he didn't when, stay with it, he went back to jail chaplaincy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one day he said, he said, I, I'm going to be stepping off and, you know, I'm going to go back to the jail. And I was disappointed that he wasn't going to be there to follow at the hospital. And I kind of felt like I was shorted. Mm -hmm. But it was a great opportunity. Those early days as a chaplain were, were um, more flexible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in some ways the hospitals have changed a little bit since then. Mm -hmm. Things are much more rigid. Than they were those early days. You know, one of the one of the toughest things about chaplains is you you um, quite often spend your time with people who are having their worst day. Yeah. And they don't have any way to blow it off and say it's it's a bad day. It's a, they, you know they think it's a bad day and uh, and they just want somebody to share it with them and. I got to do a lot of that, and I got to sit with people, uh, plan their funeral. Mm. I got to sit with people and help them know what they needed to say there at the funeral. Mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the weirdest things, um, 
because it was a funeral that I took uh, that I'd overseen a guy that was, uh, I met him in a hospice, and I can't give away too much of the story uh, of him, but, but uh, the funeral was at uh, one of the big funerals here in town, and one of the songs that, they, that he wanted to have sung at the funeral, I mean, I'm used to being somebody wanting to have how great thou art or something. Yeah. But he said, uh, I want to play this song. He could play pretty good guitar. He could sing reasonable. And uh, he said, I want um, to do Highway to Hell. <laughs> Highway to Hell. <laughs> Which kind of surprised me, sort of. Uh, but he said, it's kind of how some my life was, and especially how this has been with the cancer. So he, he did that. <laughs> and then he had a, an entourage of, of friends that became his pallbearers that day. Kind of, inf kind of just got into the role. And they sang Highway to Hell while carrying his casket out to the purse to take him to the cemetery. <laughs> it was the strangest thing <laughs> to have that song being played. And he's just like really gravelly voice and he's just growl singing. So like, wow, and this is, a, this is your funeral exit. And uh, there was a lot of those kind of moments where I would engage people in their hernia's moment. Yeah. And they would be very, very uh, pant transparent, but it was, it was real. Mm -hmm. um, and even though it didn't seem like it was a normal process necessarily, you know, one of the weirdest uh, funerals I've ever I've been to. A lot of funerals, uh, you know, of my pastor friends. Um, I've got the dubious distinction that I've I've uh, preached a lot of funerals. I've done two weddings. Um, <laughs> One of which my was my son was involved with, and uh, I just don't have any normal experience. And uh, you know, one of the things I, I got to do was to help people size up their life. You know, they uh, one of the w weird things I got to do was with you. Um, a funeral that was out at, out at uh, a cemetery just out on the edge of town. And there was going to be a cremation, and the dad of this this uh, child he wanted to push the button. Oh yes, I'll never forget that one <laughs> at he, the crematorium. Yeah, yeah. He can, you know, the body's put in there, and he pushes the button, and there was lots of family there, lots of friends there, um, but it was pretty intense because of the cremation, and. Everybody booked it out of the <laughs> out of the room and started hoofing it across the cemetery yard. I never watched that happen before. Yeah, the, the when that uh, furnace yeah. hit that button and it was like a jet engine starting up, yeah. it goes whoosh, and it was so loud and it was shocking. Yeah, yeah it shook everybody. And, yeah, you know it. Uh, it was an interesting thing how people grieve. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't trade that experience off, but it was uh, some some good learning. Yeah. You know, I think uh, you would see more than the rest of us um, just how prepared or ill-equipped uh, people are. Mm -hmm to face the, the natural, natural death, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, when, um, when you started your chaplaincy training, uh, your clinical pastoral education credits were at, was it Mercy Hospital? Uh, Children's Hospital. Or Children's Michigan. Hospital in Detroit. Yeah. And is that downtown? Yeah. Yeah, so tell, tell us a little bit about uh, you know, you're um, you're this. Uh, you kind of grew up a bit of a country boy, mm -hmm. but uh, then you, uh, in your work life with compassion, you ended up traveling all over 
North America, visiting probably dozens of major cities. Uh, but uh, could anything have prepared you for chaplaincy on the floor in a downtown Detroit hospital? No. Um, one of my first evenings, we used to do these on calls. We'd have to stay overnight to the hospital. And if the phone rang in our room, that was our call to go to meet something on the floor. I'm watching the news, doing my homework, and it's almost 11 at night. And I'm watching the story, and some dad went nuts and shot his wife and four or five of his kids. Hmm. It was all in the news. And then I heard the newscaster say, uh, the kids are being taken to children's. Uh, wow, I get to see the news, now I get to see the kids, really. Oh. This is wild. And when I got, when I went downstairs to the, to the merge, I had this kid that would have been five or six, and he had a shot here, just behind the ear. Mm. And it was kind of irritating him, to say the least, and he was very upset. And he asked me to, to hold him down, don't, don't let him wiggle, and he wanted to wiggle. His body could not wiggle. And I was supposed to pin him while the, the x-ray tech shot the pictures. So x-ray's trying to hold this kid, I'm pinning the kid, and the kid's saying to me, mister, mister, please don't hurt me anymore, please don't hurt, please don't hurt me. Oh. And, uh, trying to hold him on the bed and uh, finally we got him taken care of but that was my first night as a, as a chaplain wow and I had this uh, piece of paper with me that I was writing notes of what I was doing on my visits with the patients and I was getting ready to write the farewell note to my supervisor saying I don't have the guts for this this is too much to take in, and I don't have the stamina to deal with this. So I'll write my resignation note for tomorrow, and I'll give it to him in the morning. By the time morning came, I lost my nerve to write it. And I saw the good that I could be part of, the beauty of, of being somebody to somebody in a very hard time. Um, I had a, had a mom come in there, emerge one day there, um, and she left suddenly. She brought a kid in that she'd feigned that he that he needed um, pain medicine. She wanted oxys, hmm. not for him, but for her. And uh, so she left. And a little bit later, she came back in emergency doors. And I saw she had her hand in her pocket, and it was kind of bulky. She had a gun. <laughs> and she was going to pop the doc that wouldn't write or anything. Oh, my. And you saw this unfolding. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we had, we had security guards at that hospital who wore uniforms and carried real guns. And uh, I said to the lady, I said, I can get you to talk to somebody, but right now you got to go here. And I was directing her to a quiet room. Mm-hmm and uh, just to stay in there and then I'll get the doctor to come. And I told the police while she was in there, um, you're gonna have to go in there and you're gonna have to get a gun out of her. Um, but I'm trying to keep her in her room. And I learned how to, how to deal with somebody's total off of it mm. and help them talk themselves through whatever it is yeah. they need to work through. You know, there's been so many times where, where I worked with families and individuals in the hospital where the pieces weren't coming together and I was not really prepared for what they were going to do. I, I had this one family, the, uh, the son, it was on Christmas, Christmas Day, and the son had shot himself here in Windsor and he was brought to the hospital in the merge. And 
family just couldn't get their act together. The mother of that family, she crept down on the floor and started banging her head on the floor, forehead to, to floor, because she couldn't cope with the loss, the pain and misery. And my job was to help her play it out. Mm. I had a nurse that wanted me to pull up shop and do something to her, but there was nothing that anybody was going to do for her. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm putting a pillow down on the floor for her to put her head on and talk to her to, to try to just relax and take my company. And I helped her work through the harshness of that horrible thing and put some perspective on, on their night. And it wasn't that I was particularly good. I don't think I've ever been particularly good as a, as a chaplain. But I really felt a real call to enter into their stuff. Yeah. And, and as much as I didn't know what all their stuff was, that didn't matter as much as the fact that I was willing to, to do it. And that, that was what put me in a footing for, for doing chaplaincy. It it sounds like the difference between that and just say social work is that you sincerely must be spirit led, and to step into situations for which uh, you can make no preparation. Mm. How did that change you, working as as a chaplain? There's something that. really became sweet about being with people. <clears throat> I had so many people tell me, both pastors and church people, I don't know how you do that. Yeah. And I don't know how I did it either. I don't know how I do it. But I just know that God makes an opportunity in that spot. Mm -hmm. It's already happening. And you just press into it a little bit. You know, one of the, one of the jobs that strangely came part of my job was I, I helped with a, a company here in town that our body removal company hmm. and uh, they go to bad accidents on the 401 they go to bad situations at home like where somebody has done a suicide and they move move these people from there to the funeral home they're kind of the first leg and uh, I helped with that a little bit but I had to quit I, I couldn't bear the one part, and the one part was um, I'd been to a lot of funerals, but I hadn't been into the prep room that much. Oh, yeah. That's, were, that's another world. I never needed to know what that was like in there. Yeah. And this one day, it was very busy there, and we took a person in, and the prep room had about nine people in there getting prepped. Uh, the makeup, uh, makeup artist was there, she was doing her bit. And these people are all in their gurneys and uh, partly covered with a white blanket. And it was the strangest thing. I walked in there helping carry this person we brought in. And I felt like everybody in there was going to sit up and say, hey there. <laughs> <laughs> it was the strangest thing to see all this death. Yeah. Um, and how to relate to it. But... Uh, made me not want to do that. Uh, there, when I was 10, I used to, my, my grandfather and my mom were big, hearty funeral goers. <laughs> like the, they liked the, the dinners that would happen. The little triangle sandwiches yeah, and yeah. But all that stuff. And uh, I went to a lot of funerals, more, more than my share of funerals as a youngster. It was just you know, used to always go to Hoffman's in, in Dashwood, just outside of Grandville, where I grew up. And uh, Hoffman's, you know, we always kind of knew them. They were kind of like the boys there and the dad yep. were people we knew. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I always wanted to be funeral director. Hmm. I was going to do that one day. Yeah. But uh, never did that so far. But I worked with a lot of things that have been about death. You know that I have memories of that uh, Hoffman funeral home in Dashwood. I uh, attended 
some funerals, took part in some funerals there. Uh, actually, uh, on a hot summer day, I was uh, sitting in in the audience at a funeral and, and was nodding off, which is not a good thing for one of the pastors to be doing, but uh, the heat was getting to me. And I'll never forget uh, one of the Hoffman brothers. Uh, I was uh, stopping by the funeral home for some reason, and he said, hey, hey, come here, come here, come here. And so I follow him, and he takes me back into the prep room, and I had there was only one lady laid out uh, being being treated, but uh, that was uh, certainly is an unnerving experience when you're not used to it. Yep. But uh, yeah, you know, um, city hospitals have thousands of people pass through their doors all the time, and uh, you know, I'm I'm sure that there are, are shifts at the hospital when. Um, you're hopping and other times when it's, it's a, maybe a, a more sedate pace, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it, it, it's, it's an interesting intersection into a person's life because crisis always brings people to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, there's a resolve and they get to go home. And other times, uh, it's it's the beginning of the end for them, and uh, that spiritual and religious care that that you provide with people. Uh, you're a Christian. You you grew up as a Christian, and then you entered into this realm, uh, institutional chaplaincy. Uh, there's a certain sensitivity that's required of chaplains uh, when it comes to multi-faith and uh, respecting the uh, the needs of people of other faiths and uh, I, I experienced that of course as well when I was doing correctional chaplaincy and uh, but uh, talk a little bit about um, you know that kind of that journey from being, uh, you know, Joe Evangelical Christian who uh, believes that uh, Jesus is the way uh, to now um, being the guy that's securing a, a prayer mat for a Muslim or uh, arranging for, uh, you know, a, a Buddhist monk to come or all those kinds of things. Uh, uh, was that a... Uh, um, what, was that a conflict for you? Uh, how did you process that to come to uh, a, a place that is true to who you are as a Christian? It took a little doing to come to terms with that. Um, <laughs> John Stephen, that kind of helped me understand it a bit. Um, John liked to eat. <laughs> and uh, he covered a funeral in Toronto when he lived there. <clears throat> Some a Buddhist family, and part of their funeral has food um, for sacrifice. And he saw all these nice fruit and vegetables, and he thought it was a, a snack. <laughs> and he helped himself. <laughs> and then he realized afterwards that people weren't quite He ate the sacrifice. <laughs> people weren't understanding what he was up to. <laughs> um, but it always made me laugh when I thought about it, and it helped me find my footing. Um, that's it. The other thing is, God's blessed me with a, a quirky sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it is. I've been able to jump into some of these situations and get some joy, get some fun uh, that I wouldn't normally lay hold of. Yeah. But it's helped. Mm hmm. Um, Kind of normalizes some of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I did a I did a <laughs> funeral one time where the husband was as, as loony as they get, and he was doing his uh, tribute to his wife, and he's talking, doing, he's standing at the podium, and all of a sudden. He reaches into his coat pocket and his phone's ringing. I think, what kind of guy? 
and he he says hello. I'm thinking, uh, what kind of guy's actually going to talk on his phone to somebody? He says, um, where are you? Oh, you're there. <laughs> Is it hot? He's, he's, he's explaining this whole scenario. He was having a, a conversation with his his he, wife he, on the phone. She was in hell, <laughs> calling him on the cell. He was having a good laugh. People were flipping out in the audience who didn't know her well, didn't know him very well. Um, finally, uh, one of the directors at the funeral home came up to me and said, um, can you wrap that up? <laughs> and so I asked him for his phone, and I uh, escorted him to the side of the, the stage area and asked him, you won't be calling anymore, and we're just gonna, we're just gonna say a prayer and a blessing for your wife, and uh, we're gonna fold chop on this. And uh, people were laughing, and he was yucking it up, but it was all part of the game, it was all part of the day, and I survived through it. You know, it's, uh, it was good to be able to be part of that weird little ceremony. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, you know, you're able to help, help him lift himself from his own resources. Yeah. Which helps a lot for grief, is that people find a way to say the words. Yeah. In the strangest ways sometimes. Yeah, you have to, you have to really be able to read below the surface, mm -hmm. don't you? Um, let's talk a bit about hospice because you went from the hospital where there was, uh, in many cases, a good chance that they would survive and go home. Not always, but often. You went from there to working at hospice where uh, the stats were, you know, probably a little grimmer. Uh, not as many people uh, left there and went back home. Mm -hmm. Uh, that would be the rare exception. Most people were there to die. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we, in, in, in our, our civilization, our culture, we kind of have this expectation, uh, I think, that most people are going to, their final day is going to be in a hospital uh, under care, that it's not as common to... Um, just have uh, a drop dead heart attack and or you know die at home. We have a in in hospitalization this ability to uh, keep people alive, uh, physically, biologically alive for for a lot longer. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe indefinitely until a decision has to be made about well, is it time to pull the plug, right? Um, and uh, the, some of the things that people need um, at, if they have uh, time to die, they need some closure on life. They need to, some cases, have some uh, tough conversations mm -hmm. with family. They need to uh, be able to receive comfort, mm -hmm. you know, from, from people. And, and it seems sometimes that the clinical environment can almost uh, uh, so sanitize and so mm -hmm. remove the natural process of death from where it usually happened more at home. Um, but then, then hospice uh, seems to go the other way and, and create this uh, home-like environment uh, where people can have a lot more human comfort mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, less medical intervention as needed for comfort, but not um, kind of, well, there's a 5% chance, so we're going we're gonna to do this invasive thing. Yeah. So talk to me a bit about the transition to hospice and what were some things that uh, you experienced uh, there and... and um, I, I really enjoyed uh, when you were chaplain there the invitation to come to your uh, your memorial services and uh, maybe you want to talk a bit about that too. I got to come and do music yeah. and 
And uh, to me, that was uh, just one of the highlights of my year was that service. And but talk about talk about hospice care and and some of your insights there. A lot of people um, find it surprising that when people go into hospice, um, they kind of expect them to die quickly somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, many uh, residents settle down mm -hmm. because the staff are very skilled at managing um, painkillers and are very skilled at having conversations of talking about end of days. And there's some peace that comes with that to the heart and soul of a patient and to family. You know, they, could, uh, they just settle down and sometimes they actually physically feel better than they did because medication is more available. It's used to do control. It's not for treating, you know, treating is not always comfortable. It's not always a comforting thing for a family or for the patient. But uh, when people are footing up, putting on the footing for death, and they're getting pain management, it's very good for them. It helps them uh, sleep. Mm -hmm. Helps them sometimes actually eat. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they can actually. Uh, watch a TV show that they really enjoy. Mm -hmm. I, we, we have, uh, we had people that worked at hospice that did a lot of music therapy, not, not like what you would do, but it was used to, uh, um, kind of a cerebral way of managing. And, uh, um, they would like to do touch therapy, which was a way of, bringing soothing into the body by bringing positive energy from one person to the sick person. Mm -hmm. And this was one gentleman, he said, oh, why? He said, why do they always leave really um, orchestra music when they leave? He says, I just I really don't know that. I don't like that music. When they leave it, it's, it's, I, don't, I never listen to it much. He said, what can I do? And I said, well, I know from talking with your wife that you are a huge um, uh, ball fan, that you like the ball team here in Detroit, and you watch them and you listen to them on radio. I said, how would you like it if I tuned in your radio and you could listen to your team lose? <laughs> and he laughed. <laughs> and he says, they lose a lot. Yeah, I say I know they do. So how would you like to spend the night just listening to them lose and enjoying that? And so we brought that in, and he listened to the game fall bad, and uh, made him happy. Yeah, made him relax. And uh, you know, all the therapeutic things kind of made him ed agitated a bit. <laughs> Watching these guys lose. It was great, you know. It's, you know, it was really neat to see how people have utilized their world, mm. the things that they normally had in their world, mm. to find ways to, to deal with it. I wonder if that's a, a great analogy for how sometimes we do church poorly. Uh, we we've got our therapeutic music that we figure is going to 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 comfort and and uh you know give people peace and and uh but for some people it just agitates them yep. <laughs> yeah uh that hospice certainly is a lot more personal isn't it mm -hmm. you know it's um um one of the the issues uh in uh, medicine is, of course, made in, and that uh, medical assistance in, in dying. And uh, um, I know that uh, with your role as a chaplain, and uh, then having been in hospice and and watching the changes uh, that have are come have come and are coming, 
Um, talk about MADE and, and what, what's your take on what's happening? I think MADE is an offer from Madison when they are frustrated and don't know what else to say. They don't know what else to tell a patient. You know, the, cook, the, the cookbook actually fails. Yeah. Everything that the doctors use. They can't get medicine in to take away the pain. They can't slow the uh, effects of this disease. And MADE is, is a way of substituting and providing some kind of comfort mm. against really difficult times, really difficult paces. Yeah. And the conversations, I've had the privilege of having conversations with the people who are bound and bent are going to do MADE. Hmm. And uh, one man that told me he wanted to do made, he said, now what does that mean? What are you going to do? What are you going to tell me? As or, a chaplain, yeah. yeah. What are your religious convictions going to do? And I said, well, I want to offer you companionship. I said, there's a story in the Bible that I absolutely love. And it's become part of my work as a chaplain. A story where Jesus has just been resurrected, been back from the dead. Um, he's walking on a, a road, and he comes up with these guys who are all upset. They say to him, "Well, wh why aren't you upset? Well, where have you been?" And he he tells them who he is, sort of. And they say, "No, oh, we would like to have your companionship." Jesus walks all this road, something like 12 miles to their house and goes for dinner with them. Sad people are upset and picking to eat dinner with them, really. <laughs> Doesn't seem like a very easy thing to do. But he ate dinner with them. And when he was getting close to being done, he blessed the bread, he prayed with them. And when they, when they broke the bread, they recognized who he was hmm. because he was there breaking his life into theirs. Hmm. And so much of what the work is that, that I've come to know is we're helping people come to terms by breaking Jesus into the moment, you know, breaking ourselves into the moment and bringing life to the moment. Hmm. And, you know, that's probably the, the most significant thing I've gotten to do over the years mm. is, you know, break into the moment with somebody. Yeah. And help them, help them recognize Jesus in this pitiful, pitiful moment. Yep. Give, give me advice, Paul, on um, uh, anybody that's listening to the podcast. Tell, give us some... Uh, direction about being in really uncomfortable circumstances, uh, somebody else's uncomfortable circumstances. Uh, and, you know, the, the ministry of presence that you're talking about, how, um, how can we learn to better mourn with those who mourn? Um, how can uh, we be um, appropriate and uh, because a, a lot of people, myself included, I have an instinct to want to retract and to stay away because I don't know what to say or how to respond. So help us out. Give us some ideas here. I think just to, to take the time to Recognize what they're feeling, what they're saying, what they're not saying, and realizing that that's the, the way in. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you know, Carol Derbyshire, who was the, the director at the time at hospice, and I worked there, people would ask her something like, well, um, what do you tell people? And 
she would say this thing that sounded a little bit careless, but it wasn't. It was not. Right. They, you know, just they would say, "How do you know how to say what to be?" And she would say, "We don't know. We've never died." That was a fair statement, because either the dying are asking what's going on, or the people that love them is asking what's going on. And uh, the one that can talk in closer, pour their heart out, let their heart be tore open, they get to do something. Yeah. It's powerful stuff. Yeah. You know, it's very powerful stuff. I got one more question for you, and uh, you know, 20 or 30 years from now, when someone lays your body in the ground, and the preacher gets up to summarize your life in 10 minutes, um, what do you want to be your legacy? What do you want to be when people say, oh, I remember Paul Sherrill, uh, what would you like people to remember about you and uh, who you are? I hope that people know that I care, mm -hmm. that I don't just serve lip service on it. Yeah. Um, I've gotten to love an awful lot of life. You know, this last year, when I got sick, whatever all went wrong, I lost some the capacity to involve and get involved. Coordination was kind of gone. Uh, my voice was crippled up a little bit, and I didn't know what to do with it. Um, but I'm grateful for the opportunity. Not that I went through all that, but that I found some ways to still express life. You know, that's a powerful opportunity. I use the word powerful too much, but but there's a lot of wonderful things in life that we don't miss out on when we plug into the, the stuff that's going on in people's lives. Yeah, yeah. And uh, your, own, your own journey with Jesus, um, I know it's been a um, this isn't the first time in your life that you've been through a, a difficult season, uh, but uh, um, when you compare the good seasons and the bad seasons, what can you tell me about, about uh, Jesus in your life? He's ever-present. Mm -hmm. He's interested. Good stuff like that. Yeah. And and he feels what you feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well Paul, uh, I just wanna I wanna thank you so much for uh, taking time to be with me and and to have this conversation. And uh, um, like I said in the opening remarks, uh, you've you've been a remarkable friend and influence in my life. And uh, you've often been the truth bearer, the one that uh, has, has spoken um, from, from the depths uh, to, to me when I needed to hear something from God. And so I want to thank you for that, Paul. And, and um, well, thanks so much for, uh, for taking this time. Thank you. And that's my friend, Paul Sherrill and uh, I so appreciate his bedside manner. On the next episode, uh, we're going to Montreal and uh, I'm going to be uh, talking with Graham Singh. Graham Singh is the Anglican priest at St. Jack's in downtown Montreal. Also, he's the director of the Trinity Center Foundation. And uh, the Trin Trinity Center Foundation is transforming 100 
city center uh, church buildings into community hubs. Uh, and part of that um, organization is uh, helping churches to uh, continue to be uh, in the historic buildings, but opening themselves up to uh, other partners uh, for use of the space. So that's gonna be a really interesting conversation that you won't wanna miss out on. So please come back and uh, listen to part one of Graham Singh. Until next time, I'm Kevin Rogers, and you're listening to Sidewalk Skyline Podcast.